Okay, ladies and gentlemen, assemble Tory scum. Um, <laughs> one hand went up at least. There you go. He's, he's volunteered himself. Thank you so much uh, for joining us here in Manchester, the Conservative home fringe of the Conservative Party conference. Thank you for all of those of you who are joining us through the Conservative Party app and live on YouTube as well. If you're watching at home through the party app, don't forget you can submit your questions through Slido. My name's Mark Wallace. I'm the chief executive of Conservative Home, and I'm delighted to say we're able to start on time after Professor Paul Dolan almost fell victim to the tender documents checking mercies of Greater Manchester Police, but we've managed to navigate that. <laughs> no comment. Um, you're joining us for really what could not be a more vital and timely discussion. It's a Conservative Home event in partnership with the London School of Economics and Political Science um, on the topic grappling with groupthink, how a smarter state can make better decisions. And we've all known, I think for our whole lives, the, uh, the, the, the concept that the power of the state and its unique position of authority and might um, it brings potential opportunities for it, but, but huge risks. And I think we've particularly seen during the course of the last 20 very difficult months <coughs> quite how far its powers can extend, potentially for good when needed in a life-threatening crisis, but potentially for bad also when it blunders. And not just in the pandemic, but well beyond that crisis, we can all think of moments when decisions have been made well or badly, for good or bad reasons, uh, in all sorts of arms of the state. And it's particularly for that reason that we're gathered now with this uh, panel to look at this from every single direction. We have representatives as famous scrutineers from the Commons, uh, parliamentarians with a background in uh, ad advising within government and policy making, people who've sat around the cabinet table and, uh, of course, the professor himself from academia. So um, you didn't come here really to hear from me, so I've overrun my time by about threefold already. So uh, without further ado, while we give the, uh, Professor Paul Dolan a couple of minutes to catch his breath, I think we'll go over to Steve Baker uh, first. He'll be familiar to all of you who needs no real further introduction from me, but uh, an MP distinguished for many reasons, not least because in his constituency there's the fine tradition where they weigh the MP to make sure he's not getting fat on the public purse <laughs> in the town square every story. year. A good example of aligning, thing, yes. aligning incentives <laughs> with outcomes in public policy. Yeah. Um, over to you, Steve. Yeah, thanks very much. I've been losing weight recently and I will continue. Well, it's great to see all of you here. Thank you very much indeed for coming. Um, I don't know about you, but I don't want to live through the last 18 months ever again. I mean, who knew that the state could take away our freedom so comprehensively and so suddenly with so little parliamentary scrutiny uh, and with, if I may say so, so little regard for the side effects, the collateral damage. So um, I really am grateful that you're here. I'm really grateful that so many people will be watching online. And I think this is a really important subject to a wide range of areas of public policy. Because, goodness, haven't we discovered that scientific advice in particular is really tightly coupled now to politics and power? So I want to just briefly recommend four reforms, all of which are expertly advised, one of which by Paul Dolan on this panel, I have to say, I'm really glad you're here to hear from Paul because he's the second best professor LSE have ever had. Why? Who was the best professor, Harry, that they've ever had? Yeah, we go. Sorry, Paul. <laughs> but other than that, he's my absolute favourite. So the four reforms are these. First of all, I thought, well, where did we begin in this journey of scrutiny of the government? It was Graham Brady and I saying this isn't good enough, that we're not getting votes in advance in the House of Commons before our freedoms are taken away. So as a politician, I suppose I'm bound to start with Parliament. So I think we need a new Public Health Act, and so I asked Lord Sumption, I don't like to mess about, I asked Lord Sumption what should we have in this new Public Health Act, and he uh, did me a note which is available online. Pause for the photo. I learnt from, the, learnt from the best. But there's basically a number, of <laughs> a number of provisions. First of all, the Public Health Act as it currently stands is probably fine for people who are actually infected or suspected of being infected. People, individuals, who have actually tested positive. And so the Public Health Act powers in their regard can be carried over. But powers in relation to other people and premises, all of the collateral damage, people who are not infected, having their freedoms taken away, deserves to be treated in the same way as the Civil Contingencies Act, which I'll come back to. The third point is that if you're going to lock people down at home who aren't sick, you should have a proper impact assessment, which I'll come back to uh, in a moment. 
And, and you've got to be able to say that the measures you're proposing are on reasonable grounds, necessary and proportionate, having regard to both that impact assessment and the effect on personal liberty. How do you quantify the effect on personal liberty? Well, I'm 50. I'm getting to a point now I know how quickly the years rush past. So I've really missed the last year. But what if you're in your early 20s or your school children? What on earth has it mean to you, meant to you to basically lose a year of your life, all that fun you were, you were planning? There's some provisions in relation to urgency and limited provisional validity, but the crucial point is that by having regulations in the same style as the Civil Contingencies Act, they expire very quickly and they have to come back to Parliament. And as, as, so the, the fifth point on a new Public Health Act is that unlike any other statutory instrument in Parliament, apart from under the Civil Contingencies Act, under a new Public Health Act, statutory instruments should be amendable. That sounds so dreary. But for example, one of the biggest rebellions we had was over the curfew on restaurants. Why? Because restaurants are profitable if they can get two covers through in an evening. And the curfew that was put on made them unprofitable. And we had, that's why we had plenty of MPs who wanted to vote to change that. But we could only vote down the entire instrument. So we need, it's really, really important that when the government is, ex when ministers are exercising really draconian delegated powers, that members of parliament can amend those delegated powers. So that's the first thing, a public health act. The second thing, which was tied into that, I'm absolutely going to leave to Paul Dolan, and that is how to do proper cost-benefit analysis. I like to go out to proper experts before I do things. People might disagree with me, but I always try and find a proper expert. Paul is a proper expert. I would listen to Paul on this question of impact assessment, and I hope that you will too. The, the next thing is to come on to expert advice. Who here agrees with me that experts are only human too? Right? Once you, once you know that experts are only human too and respond to incentives, then you have to start putting in place institutions which take that into account. So, for example, if an expert predicts doom and disaster and turns out to be wrong, that is not a big downside risk for them. If they make a prediction that things won't be too bad and it's much worse, then that is potentially a total disaster for them and for their careers. That's just one example. So I wrote to the Prime Minister, again, there's a one-page, I haven't got time to go through it all, but four points. You need to simulate a market for expert advice using competing experts. Secondly, three expert, independent expert opinions on a critical policy. So three different groups making available their advice to the Prime Minister. To expose the partial perspective of experts by having complementary fields in teams. So for example, let's not ask epidemiologists what they think about how profitable uh, restaurants might be under a curfew. Let's ask business people. Let's not ask epidemiologists about educational harms and so on. So you need really complementary fields and you need red teams. The job of the red team is always to challenge. In Israel, I think it's known as the 10th man. But the 10th man's job is always to disagree. Maybe it's a job I should volunteer for. <laughs> but, um, so that's the one. And the next point, right, the, the next one, so that's three of the reforms. The other one, and I got a very senior, that expert advice stuff comes from a guy called Professor Roger Koppel, who's a great personal friend. Um, and the, the modelling stuff, here's the modelling stuff off um, the Spectator's website. You won't be able to see it from there, but I look at it and I think, how wrong do these models have to be? How often before we say we've got to reform the way that modelling is done? As a software engineer, I looked at their code absolutely diabolical and that's just the software so the, the practical reality is these models have been wrong time and time again and yet they absolutely have determined our fundamental freedoms you know it and I know it so there's a whole suite of reforms that we could do to modeling uh, which I'm not going to go through now because I feel I've talked a long time so my point to you is this I think that Public Health England probably believe they've had a good crisis and made good decisions but I'm afraid I think they have made far, far worse decisions with far, far more collateral damage than they could, uh, could have made. And I think those things are going to be with us for a very long time in people's mental health, educational attainment, and so on and so on. We're sure we'll hear more from other panellists. So I recommend four things. A new Public Health Act with proper parliamentary scrutiny. Better impact assessments, a wide ranging, which Paul's going to tell us about. Reforms to expert advice so we stop asking the impossible of real human beings. And fourth, for goodness sake, let's sort out, the, out these models. It is not good enough, in my view, to leave all of this to the inquiry. I believe at the moment that is number 10's plan. Just leave, long grass it, because we're not going to have another pandemic. Long grass it, leave it all to the inquiry. I'm absolutely clear that is not good enough. 
it is not good enough because the state very clearly now wields absolute power over all of our lives <coughs> and it uses that absolute power on the basis of all these things which are going wrong. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's do something. Let's do it now. Thank, thank you very much for that, Steve, and thank you for the warm, warm welcome for him from the audience. I think, uh, as I mentioned at the outset, when, when we're talking about this, um, the, this question of expertise and advice and decision making and scrutiny, that's precisely why we've compiled this, this panel, not, not just on COVID, but on, on, uh, across the suite of government decision making, in order to um, be able to look at that from each direction. So our, our next speaker, now he's hopefully caught his breath, is Professor Paul Dolan, who's the ah. Professor of Behavioural Science at the, the LSE, um, also well known from the Duck Rabbit podcast of his, um, looking at questions of polarisation, um, an expert in himself, but also an expert on how people deal with expertise and how they make decisions. Paul. An expert in, in himself, that's perfect. I am an expert in myself. That, is my, that will be my chosen specialist subject. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, this, is the, this is actually the first in-person event I've done, I think, for 18 months. And it's amazing. It's really fucking exciting to actually be in a room with so many people. I knew you'd swear. I just didn't think it'd be so soon. <laughs> I, I, I did think it would be so soon. So you <laughs> I had a student, students once played uh, Word Bingo, and obviously that was one that they all had right from the beginning. And for some reason on that day, I didn't swear. And then finally at the end, I did, and the whole room went absolutely <laughs> crazy. Um, so um, I just want to say what he said. I mean, there, isn't actually, there actually isn't really much more to add, but let me add a few things that come to my mind. I want to give you the behavioral bias that sets the tone within which we respond to crisis, and actually karma times too. And it's called situational blindness. It's a well-known psychological phenomenon that you pay attention to what's in front of you because it's important because it's in front of you. And you're not paying attention to what substantively matters that's going on around you. Now this has been, we've been alerted to this in a number of environments for many decades. The most prominent example comes from the airline industry. Many more planes crashed than would otherwise have been the case when pilots were taking off without co-pilots, for example. Right now, you see that's a pretty obvious thing. But they were situationally blind to the importance of a co-pilot. What they were doing was they were checking whether the instruments were on, the engines were running, and forgot to pay attention to something that's substantively important. You see it in surgical operating theatres, where often they'd operate on the wrong patient, give them the wrong hip, and do all sorts of things that checklists fundamentally overcome. That's the first thing. First simple thing. Checklists draw you away from situational blindness. They remind you of what's fundamentally important when you're making a policy decision. Imagine if we'd had a checklist in you know, January, February, March, whatever, last year, that maybe even only had a half a dozen things on it. It doesn't have to be a very extensive, long list of items. What if it had on it the economic impacts? What if it had on it the impact on young people? What if it had on it the impact on now, what is it, 135,000 children missing from school, right? Now, of course, some of those, many of those will be kids that are anxious and scared and are home um, schooling, but not all of them. Probably about half of them have literally gone missing. Literally gone missing. We don't know where they are and they're not in nice places, right? Having those items on a checklist, leave all the cost benefits to one side for a moment, that would have led to better policy. And actually, for those that might be interested in my own personal story with this, that's what concerned me the moment I woke up, lockdown was announced the following day, was all the kids in my own, you know, uh, I've got a 13 and 12 year old kid uh, now, the people in their school who were being sent into vulnerable homes where they really shouldn't be spending very much time at home. Where were the voices around the decision making table? We still might have made the same decisions. That's really important to make that clear, right? I don't know, it's a world of, it's a world of uncertainty. Who knows what to do? But we do need to have proper, genuine diversity of experience, perspective, and expertise around the, the, the actual table. And you're absolutely right, so just to emphasize again, it's not the role of epidemiologists to tell us that schools should close or should stay open or whether we should have 10 p.m. curfews. It's a role for them to advise on transmission risks and hospitalizations and deaths, but that alone. This has been a health, economic, and social crisis for which we needed a health, economic, and social consideration 
um, and a process by which those kinds of decisions were made. So that's, that's, that's to reinforce what, um, what has been said. Because fundamentally, situational blindness is a bias that we will not overcome unless we properly embed the right processes in order to overcome it. Um, now, on the, I feel like I, I, I feel compelled to say something about the impact assessments and the CPA because I have actually, in one way or another, I've sort of bounced around a lot in my academic life as I get bored with things. Um, but for all, all, almost all of those 30 years, in one way or the other, I've been concerned about how you measure the stuff that people really care about but doesn't get bought and sold in markets. So we care about clean air, we care about health impacts, we care about social interaction, we care about all these things that we don't directly trade, that we can't put a monetary value on directly. And there are now techniques and methods that we can use in order to monetize or value at least in the first instance some of those effects. I mean, actually, fundamentally, it's actually quite straightforward. We care about two things. We care about how long we live and we care about how well we live. Life goes better when it's longer and better. So, obviously, we would want some kind of metric that both captures increases in life expectancy and improvements in life experience. We now have metrics to do that. I spent a lot of my early academic life generating quality adjusted life years that are now being used by NICE. They're only a partial picture. They only give you the health impacts. Well-being adjusted life years give us the opportunity to account for the well-being changes more completely. The fact that people have spent, many people have spent the last 18 months isolated. Which actually, by the way, you don't even need to care about well-being to care about that. If you were ranking health interventions according to their impacts on life expectancy, loneliness is right near the top. It's up there with smoking and diet and exercise are way down the list. So even if you only cared about life expectancy, which would be on your checklist presumably, then you would care about isolating people for so long. So expressing these impacts is possible in a single metric, and I can talk some more about that later if people want to pick up on that, uh, using well-being adjusted life years. The thing I will add about that is over the lifetime. I am an egalitarian who cares about the distribution of well-being over the lifetime. I want you to have as long a life as possible and as good a life as possible. And the less of that you have, or the less of that you can expect, the greater priority you should be for public policymakers. But think about what we've done over the last 18 months, is that we've inflicted significant damage and harm on those people whose life expectancies and life experiences were short in the first place, and will now be even shorter as a result. We have, we have done basically the biggest Robin Hood in reverse that you could imagine, I think. We have literally taken from those that have the least to give to those that have already had the most. And we see that writ large across public policy. This, isn't, this, is, this is just a magnification, actually, of what we see quite broadly and widely. So, but as to say, it's not enough to, to do these. You know, you know that the Treasury has the Green Book guidance, right? 150 odd pages of it. It's a wonder no one reads it. Um, but, you know, that should, every time there's a policy, we should actually go through the Green Book. No one pays any attention to it because it's not embedded in law, which is why we need something like this Public Health Act. We also need fora that really do genuinely bring together, just to restate it, different experiences, expertise, different perspectives, to properly discuss and debate these issues. I've been really struck, struck over this, I think we've got groupthink as a title, have we? Yeah. So it's been extraordinary to me over the last 18 months that I've felt like quite an academic loner. Um, well, I do anyway, but... Uh, <laughs> And not like most academics at LSE, but in any event, intellectually I felt quite alone when so many people have been so certain about what our policy response should be. How the fuck anybody could know what we should do? Uncertainty, by its very nature, would lead to different perspectives, opinions, and argument and discussion, and we've had hardly any. And that is, that is a, a, in the academy, I mean, you kind of ex might expect it amongst, you know, politicians, but in the academy, <laughs> where we should be looking at good evidence, and it's been extraordinary how little we have. Um, and on the diversity point, just to, just, to, just to make one further point on that, is if you think about all the decision makers and their advisors 
not just here, but around the world, they're probably our ages, plus or minus a few years, nearly all of whom work in the public sector, nearly all of whom can work at home on full salaries and full pensions, nearly all of whom actually have quite nice houses, nearly all of whom are shit scared of dying. And that's really important. I make that as a really serious point because one of the, one of the few robust findings we get from happiness research is a U-shape in age. For those of you that are young or old, Actually, those that are old, you can be thankful that you're actually getting happier. The young people, you're going to have a midlife crisis. Now, this is actually, this is, this is well established across pretty much every data set around the world. You sort of dip into your 40s, and then by the time you get to Steve's age, my age, I'm a little bit older than him, um, we start getting happier, and then you get happier and happier until the last few months of your life, which can be pretty shit. Um, but, the early, but the early years you're going to go into this dip. Now, that, now that, this is a well-established finding, which, which is really suggestive of something quite basic and primal. You actually find it in monkeys in zoos, where the zookeepers rate the happiness of the primates, and they have a midlife crisis as well. Now, I suspect that that midlife crisis, and this is some research that we're now starting, is heavily related to existential dread. Right? When you're young, you don't think about dying because why would you going to live forever? When you're older, you've come to terms with the fact that you haven't got another 50 years. When you're in mid-years, in midlife, that's the point at which it really hits you. And so just think then about some of the policy decisions we've made that have been through the lens of, and again, I, I want to be absolutely clear, we might still have made the same decisions, but had we had different perspectives and voices in the room when we're making them, we would at least be confident that that diversity was being accounted for. Shall I shut up? I reckon so. I reckon so. I re so just to, so, so I, I feel like I should do some summary after I've done my stream of consciousness. Um, the, oh, I will say something about the public inquiry then, maybe just as, just, just as a final point, because I'm not at all confident that the public inquiry will consider any of these issues, right? I mean, obviously, I kind of, you know, would defer to, to those who will know more about this than I do, but I, I have a very strong suspicion that the public inquiry will be focused almost entirely on deaths from COVID. And that will be a real missed opportunity. We need to ensure that that public inquiry asks some of the questions that we're all talking about today, that when we next face the next crisis, which we will, there'll be something else coming along, that we deal with it better and smarter. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Paul. I should say, ladies and gentlemen, anybody who has completed their Paul Dolan bingo cards that we dished out before he arrived, um, <laughs> see me afterwards. There's no prize, but well done. Um, I've also got the heartwarming lesson that at the age of 37, I've just got to cling on to the warm, happy embrace of, of, of old age when I can feel joy again. Um, <laughs> it's just a Monday of conference feeling. What can I say? Um, Thank you so much for that. that. That was absolutely fascinating. Our, our next speaker, uh, Laura Trott, is, is MP for Seven Oaks, which, as I mentioned earlier, gives her a great perspective as a parliamentarian, a scrutineer of decision making. But she's also been on the other side of that fence as well, um, serving in really the two uh, crucial uh, power wielding and decision making. Uh, organs of central government, uh, number 10 Downing Street, but also the Cabinet Office in, in a, a special advisor, as a strategist, and also helping to write the 2015 uh, manifesto. And I, I'd be particularly interested, actually, from some of the things we've just heard, uh, in her experience as advisor to Francis Maud in those early coalition years, the big Whitehall um, uh, reforms. I, I, I know that, if I recall correctly, Francis wanted to do even more. He um, did. Uh, I think he was probably right. Um, so please join me in welcoming uh, Laura. Well, look, I'm so grateful to Conservative Home and LSE to, for talking about this subject today because it's been something which has been slightly out of vogue for a period of time. We used to talk quite a lot about how we can make government work more effectively and make better decisions. And actually, that's not something we've talked about for a while. And it is critical because I've seen, as Mark alluded to, from the inside and the outside, how the structures that you put around your decision-making process can actually guide you in terms of the effectiveness of what you actually end up doing. So it's, it's a really central, um, central policy question that every everyone should be thinking about. 
From my perspective, I think there are, there are two, two points that I've kind of come to. Firstly, that the government needs better information when making decisions, and I'll talk about that in a second. But also, there needs to be consequences on the basis of that information. You know, it's very easy to kind of sit there and go, oh, you know, the water's uh, flowing out the bath, and someone actually needs to come up and say, okay, we're going to turn the taps off now. And too often in government, uh, the latter doesn't actually happen. So just on the information point, it is truly remarkable how little information government has um, when making some decisions. It is, uh, you know, Steve was talking earlier about, you know, the, the models and the models aren't right. And of course, he's right to point that out. I was amazed there were models in government, frankly. I was in the number 10 policy unit for a long period of time. I think I probably saw two or three submissions with a chart in them. I mean, I, I used to be a management consultant, so I, you know, very long time ago, I've rapidly de-skilled, but um, I used to be able to work a spreadsheet in a, in a fairly effective way. I think I was the only person that could do so in pretty much most of government apart from the Treasury, to be honest, which is, which is something that I think is being addressed now, but is, uh, is very much overdue. So there's a lack of kind of data analysis about decisions, but there's also a, lack of, a fundamental lack of evaluation about what is going on. There are, for big programmes, um, there are kind of some analysis of how they're performing. But you think about all that money that government spends, all the individual projects, there's no analysis done on any of them as to how effective they have actually been. You know, and that partly is a, is a problem of embarrassment, frankly. You know, government are not very good at saying, actually, we did this and it didn't work for this reason, or this was great, or we do this differently later. And a lot of it is around the prism of value for money, which is important. But in terms of behavioural change, how this has impacted people's life, what people actually think about the programmes that have been put in place, none of this information is actually gathered on a routine basis. And I think that's something that we really need to look about. And we need to think about how we make that public and how we kind of engage in a conversation about um, the, evaluating the effectiveness of programmes, which is not just about pointing a figure at government and saying, oh, this is awful, because it's, the incentives there are then not to kind of be as open as possible about the, the programmes that you're running. I also think it's necessary to capture more information as we're going. If you think about some of the most important services that you use all the time, your kids use, schools, for example. Ofsted come to schools every four years, sometimes less. How on earth are you meant to really assess how well a school is running, a judgment for parents making an incredibly difficult decision as to how, where to send their kids if they've got one inspection a long time ago? You know, ditto doctor surgeries, you know, think, you know, and then just routine information about how long people are waiting for appointments now. None of this is really captured on a kind of day to day basis, which I think is a really big problem. So I think on the information side of things, better regulation, more evaluation, more information just coming in um, to government, which informs decisions, I think will be really important. And then on consequences, it's really interesting because what too often happens is people gather data, they say, oh, this is very important, and then nothing actually happens. I, I as was alluded to earlier on, I, I sit on the Health and Social Care Committee, and we're doing uh, an inquiry into maternal safety. And one of the leading indicators of uh, whether a maternity unit is going to be safe or not is how many staff are, leading, uh, are leaving. Now, the Department of Health and Social Care said, yes, you know, we, we capture this information. And I said, well, well, what do you do with that information? And Basically, the answer is, is not very much. You know, this is not, you know, and, and they, are, they are moving in this direction, they're thinking about it, but just using the information to actually change people's behavior and look at the consequences, it's just so important to making things run better. Um, and then if you looked at, you know, how governments worked, I mean, I, I haven't talked as much about the crisis as our other speakers today, but if you think about the risk register, I think a lot of the time people think, oh, look, you know, we think this is a risk. Let's put it up on a board. It's like, what are, what are we actually doing about that? Like, what, you know, what is then the kind of follow up, which means that we are, um, as, a, as a state, saying, I've, I've assessed this risk. I know this risk is there. And this is what I am doing to actually alleviate that and allow people to interrogate that beforehand. That is also incredibly important. And um, the inquiry that uh, uh, Greg has been running, I, I sit on the Health and Social Care, as I said, and we've done a joint inquiry into the pandemic with the Science and Technology Committee, which Greg heads up, heads up and we're looking a little bit about that. Um, but then I think also impact assessments, which have been spoken about today, Government responds to things which are routine, as Paul said. It is, if you have it in a tick box, somebody is going to do it. And that is actually really, really powerful because the impact assessments that we have at the moment 
focus on, and they're available to all parliamentarians. You know, you can scrutinise them when you look at bills, and, and they're very helpful, but they're so narrow in scope. Um, and, they, and they really need to be widened up. I mean, we can do, again, it's all kind of, it's money-based, but we don't look at behavioural change, we don't look about um, looking at alternative policies, what they would have done. You know, the, the, the information that's in them is very, very narrow, and I think that that has a real potential to, um, to be changed. So I will, I will stop there, because I honestly could go on all day, um, but hopefully we can discuss more in, uh, in questions. Very good. Thank you so much, Laura. And the final piece of our puzzle, uh, not how he's normally introduced, I should say, <laughs> is, uh, in, in, in a nice way, is, is Greg Clark, who uh, is, as just alluded to, chair of the Science and, uh, and Technology Select Committee, but has also spent nine years as a minister. He's been a minister in the Treasury, a minister in the Cabinet Office, uh, sat around the, the Cabinet table for f five years, I believe, um, in including as Business Secretary and Communities and Local Government Secretary. So he's seen those decisions. He's been advised by special advisors. He's seen or or sought or struggled, in some cases struggled to find the, the experts or might want to input, and he's made those decisions and seen them in action. So please join me in welcoming Greg Clark. Uh, well, thank you, Mark, and it's, uh, it's great to be on uh, a Conhome platform that is reflecting on uh, the question before us is how a smarter state can make better decisions. And the fact that such a conversation uh, can be happening, I think, is a real positive step. Most conference fringe events over the last few years would not have had such a theme. Uh, as a LSE alumnus, it's a particular pleasure to be with uh, the professor and um, uh, to be under the LSE uh, orgis as well. Um, a few reflections from, uh, from experience uh, on how we can make better decisions and how we can be smarter. Uh, the first is, it won't surprise you to, to hear, to be better prepared. Uh, preparedness uh, is not something that government uh, or political parties tend to spend much time thinking about. Uh, in the conference hall, uh, when we have general elections, it's all about what we're going to do new and different. You know, what are the new policies that we're going to compete with each other? And that's, of course, absolutely right, that it's a battle of ideas that we fight every time. But if you think about it, and my experience in government, is that quite a large proportion of what you do in government is dealing with the unexpected, things that surge up, uh, things that happen. And we just need to reflect on the last uh, couple of years uh, to see the, the relevance of that. But that happens all the time. And we all know that actually when it comes to governments getting re-elected, often it's about their, their demonstrated competence in dealing with things that weren't the shiny new policies in the manifesto, but dealing with the world that, uh, that presented itself during the period in office. And yet we devote far... Uh, too little time, disproportionately minute amounts of time to thinking ahead about, if I can put it this way, what might go wrong so that if it does, we can be better uh, able to manage it. Uh, so uh, I would say that all of us need to embed that much more. Uh, it goes to the, to the long term. Uh, Laura mentioned the National Risk Register. Um, which is not the most high-profile thing. It's, uh, I think it's, it's an important uh, document. It is a document, but actually doesn't have the centrality or hasn't had the centrality that it perhaps uh, deserves to have. Or the short term. I mean, I know as a minister, uh, you know, the next morning things can, can take a turn for the worse. Um, when I was appointed business secretary shortly before, um, my predecessor had to cope with a, an unexpected steel crisis. You might remember that Tata Steel in Port Talbot um, was about to be closed. Um, and there was a terrible scramble to, to kind of respond to that. Uh, and sort of coming in fresh after that into the business department, one of the things I instituted uh, was that every weekend and every night uh, I would have in my box uh, an assessment uh, of things that were were looking problematic, um, but more particularly, what we would do about them if they went wrong. Uh, and that was partly because if they did, you'd have a kind of playbook and you'd have thought about it. But the main point was to force you to think about it. And 99 times out of 100, they didn't go wrong, 
But actually, it was pretty useful to have kind of thought through those scenarios anyway. So preparedness, I think, is, uh, should, I hope, have a higher profile. Um, the second is challenge, and this has um, uh, come across um, uh, through the discussion in the panel so far. Um, Groupthink is, is in the title that we're addressing. And th the forces of human psychology, uh, even in, uh, in government, tend to bring people to agree with each other, to, be, uh, to, to defer to people higher up the, the pecking order, sort of ministerially uh, and administratively, uh, to be supportive and loyal, especially in the context of the pandemic, you know, to be careful about spooking public opinion. <coughs> so a great deal of, uh, of natural and not, not malign, sort of well-intentioned, an inclination not to rock the boat. Um, but as Paul and Steve and Laura have uh, said, that is very dangerous because we may not be on the, the right course. And so, so you can't leave it to chance. You can't leave it to, uh, to expect that you'll have challenge to views. You need to, again, think in advance about that and have a structure so that people are empowered and indeed required to challenge. Steve mentioned having a red team, that's to say a team of people whose job it is to pull apart, to, to uh, in anticipation, look for the flaws uh, in things. Uh, and to build that into it uh, is, it seems to me, uh, a very important part of how we should manage things. Um, the third observation I would make uh, is to take an international perspective. Now, a lot of things that happen are actually not unique to, to the UK. They are global phenomenon, the, the pandemic being a case in point. We have very good scientists, we have very good officials in this country, but they're not the only ones in the world. And other countries uh, are often dealing uh, in parallel uh, with the same situations. And yet, because perhaps we've got a rich of, um, of professors, whether they're in the LSE or whether uh, they're in Imperial or uh, some of our great institutions, you're genuinely really good people. We think we've got plenty that we can call for here, but actually it's another way of getting a different perspective if you look at how other people are tackling the same thing. I'll give one example of that. Uh, in the early part of the pandemic, the experience in East Asia, countries like South Korea, we were taking quite a different path. Um, and my committee in uh, scrutinizing, questioning Public Health England asked you, have you made an evaluation of what they're doing in South Korea? Uh, and it turned out that they hadn't. Uh, we, were, we, were, we had a kind of a, a British approach to it um, that didn't really adequately, in my view, sort of take on borders, as it were, from, uh, from overseas around the world. And we should have done, and we should be explicitly open to an international perspective. Uh, uh, fourth point, transparency. Uh, the scientific method, uh, as in politics to a certain extent, is about debate and it's about uh, scrutiny. In order to do that, you need to have publication. Um, whether it's the, the code that uh, Steve mentions uh, behind models, whether it's the papers on which uh, scientific advice has been given. Early in the pandemic, um, the membership of SAGE uh, was secret. Um, the, the minutes weren't published of its meetings. We didn't know what they were concluding. We didn't even know the scientific papers to which they were referring. Um, through recommendations that my committee, the Science and Technology Committee, uh, made, that was changed. And now all of them are open. The, the sky hasn't fallen in. It gives people a better ability to, to make sure that there is some scrutiny uh, to, of the underlying uh, data. Um, and the final point that I would uh, make is that um, sometimes you need to do things differently uh, than in the past. Sometimes. Uh, there's a paradigm change, and um, Thomas Kuhn, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, is, a, is the kind of classic uh, text on this. It's how difficult it is for people to change perspective. But you have to be open to it. That's incredibly challenging, whether it's for academics, whether it's for policymakers uh, or scientists. But we, we mustn't regard uh, as subversive people who are questioning the orthodoxy. We must have that uh, embedded uh, in our systems. 
if we do all of those things, um, and I think we have the opportunity, uh, whether it's through the public inquiry, but we don't need to wait for that, the, the inquiry that the committee that Laura sits on and uh, I uh, chair with Jeremy Hunt uh, will publish its report soon, and it's a lessons learned report. It's not a finger pointing report, it's to try to learn on the way. It's so crucial that we do so. Having been through this experience, it is an opportunity to get things better and right and to make sure that we can, uh, as a country and as a government, perform much better in the future. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, uh, Greg. Now, that brings us to our, our Q&A section. I know there'll be a lot of questions, so a couple of um, things to say first. I know that Steve has to leave us at 2 o'clock, I believe, so we'll, we'll try and get as many questions into him as we can. Um, when I do pick you for a question, I say, please all raise, raise your hands as high as you can, wait for our uh, microphone uh, by my, for my colleague to get to you, and please introduce yourself. And finally, while we talk about accountability and openness, I will be tyrannical and dictatorial in that if you try to make just a short speech instead of a question, I will boo you until you sit down. <laughs> so um, that's my only other ground rule. So uh, who would like to ask a question? Um, uh, the gentleman uh, there in the, the grey jacket. Thank you. I'd like to ask the politicians, certainly in this case. Is it on? Yeah. It is on. It is on. Um, yeah. Um, a lot of what has been said up to now has been um, what, are, uh, what, what the politicians should do and why haven't they done this and uh, have they thought around the corner about this and have they prepared this and is this transparent? <laughs> but in fact, a lot of what has been said is, to me, seems to be the job of the civil servants, of the people who are are there supposedly experts, supposedly with experience, supposedly with, with expertise, and supposedly, therefore, with the plans, <coughs> um, maybe they have to dust them, uh, dust them, take them off the shelf, and, and say, well, yes, we've thought about this before, um, yes, we have prepared, yes, we have uh, got these resources, and so on and so forth. I'd like to ask, therefore, the politicians, um, Steve, Laura, Greg, uh, and, and yourself, Chair, um, what is the responsibility of the civil servants and are they up to it? Okay, having seen so many hands go up, let's get an, another question and I'll, I'll, I'll put two at once. Uh, the lady at the front here. Hi there, Daisy from the Joseph Rowntree Foundation. Um, really interesting uh, discussion. Um, and it feels like there's a real um, consensus amongst panelists that a diversity of experience and expertise is what's used, is, is what we need to, to create better decision making. Um, just really interested in the perspective of the panelists, perhaps Paul more on the sort of methodology and the politicians on, on the culture as to how we can bring the perspective of people with that actual direct experience better into the policy making process thinking obviously specifically about people from low incomes, um, given the uh, focus of our organisation, where, for example, reflecting on a policy like universal credit, a very important and much needed reform to the welfare system, lots of positives in there, but quite a few of the um, decision making was quite blunt in terms of how it actually integrated with, with the reality of people's lives. I'm thinking about the regularity of payments, how debt's deducted from people's incomes, etc. Um, which may have benefited very much from a, a much more participatory policy approach to, to that policy design. Um, so, yeah, so just really interested in kind of the methodological views, co-design, citizens, juries, uh, all, all the meat of that, and then the kind of cultural aspect of it as well, particularly in the heart of government, number 10, Treasury, where we know there can be uh, barriers to, to this way of doing things. Thank you very much. I think two not unrelated questions there, dare I say. Um, Paul, can we, can we start with your thoughts on those, please? Yeah, just a quick... Just a quick um, Caveat on diversity, right? So if you know, so if you know very clearly what the objectives and outcomes are, diversity is much less important, right? So if you know, for example, you want to win the hundred meters four by one hundred meter relay in the fastest possible time, you very clearly pick those fastest runners that are all very similar to one another, right? So what we're talking about is a diversity when the world's uncertain, when the objectives may be unclear, and when there's multiple outcomes. Then the evidence tells us that a broad range of different perspectives leads to better decision making. And of course, that's largely what we face, not every time we have a policy challenge, but nearly, nearly every time. Um, so in practice, what you obviously need to create, it's an obvious thing to say, is an environment where all those voices are heard and listened to appropriately. Because often what you will get is you'll get 
participatory panels of the kinds that you've just mentioned, and, and, and they become really a SOP, um, and they're not really properly listened to. So you need the voices to be listened to in those kind of fora, but I think this is where this plays into the policy making, is you need those organisations and those groups and those panels to feed directly into policy. They need to be given real force and bite. I made a call a little while ago for a wellbeing commission. I think that's fundamentally important that should come out of what we do next. And that would be a genuinely that would be a genuinely diverse body that would look at well-being impacts. Now, I could easily set that up, but no one would pay any attention to it. It needs to be embedded in the policy-making process. I think that's really the important challenge. I think for me. Greg, particularly on that civil service point, people have an idea in their minds in a disaster movie and the zombies arrive, someone marches out of the cabinet office, gets out the right, the right folder and says, here's the plan. Is the civil service doing this? Is it, is it doing it right? Well, there often is a plan, but it's, um, it's often in the, the bottom of the drawer and is never referred to and is never you know, put into to practice, even in a kind of uh, a, a fire drill sort of way. Um, I was talking to a a civil servant who told me that when he was appointed to a position of particular seniority um, said, um, I wonder what the, what the instructions are in the event of war. Um, and because, you know, this has big implications. And he said it took him ages to find the, the, the policy in the folder. Uh, and when he did, it was literally gathering dust uh, on the bottom of some shelf, it was way out of date. Now, this might be a kind of extreme tail risk, but actually, if you're going to have these things, you should think about it. Uh, when it comes to, to, to the role of, of the civil service, um, in a democracy, I think ministers have to be uh, accountable and held to account. And they are responsible for the, for the management of the civil service, and, and I don't think it's fair to, to, to look to the civil service to... Uh, to exonerate, I don't know if this wasn't the, your implication, to ex exonerate ministerial responsibility. Um, and I think we do have uh, good officials, but if I, if I reflect on what I've said about preparedness, um, a criticism I would make about the current fashion within the civil service uh, is to move people around very quickly. Um, I, I don't know about uh, others, but my experience uh, in government was that if people stayed in a position more than about three years, then actually there was a kind of question mark over you know, whether they were, they were moving on quickly enough, whether they had the kind of flexibility um, to take on different posts. And, and to demonstrate that, because it was required for promotion, they'd often take on posts completely unrelated to what they'd done before. And as everyone knows, I mean, if you're in, uh, if you're in business or other walks of life, you know, after three years, you're just getting uh, you know, a kind of depth of appreciation about the issues. You know, there'll be people, say it's a, a business sector that you're, you know, you're kind of working with, you're getting to know on a, in a way you can be trusted some of the key players in that. And then you move and it starts all over again. Now, it is and something that, um, that Laura has a great interest in, civil service reform. I do think we need to prize expertise and the acquisition of experience and we do that too little because it's something that ministers who inevitably are going to be less permanent uh, than the permanent civil service should be able to draw on but we've got a paradoxical situation uh, that often I mean certainly towards the end of my time in government uh, I'd acquired more experience than some of the the officials that were um, were there in the in the permanent civil service Just take Steve then Laura Against my expectations, I really loved being a minister. Why? Because you get to work with amazing people who happen to be civil servants. Does anybody remember all the problems we had about the Euratom Treaty as we left the EU, deal or no deal? Do you remember Euratom? Do you remember that there actually weren't any problems? Why weren't there any problems? Because I just decided I was going to make it a priority to ride this issue of nuclear safety and supplies and so on. And the civil servants just did what they were told across multiple departments, and we made sure it wasn't a problem. The reason I say that story is because the reality is, notwithstanding, yes, Minister, yes, Prime Minister, the civil service will do what the minister requires because the civil service sees the minister as the customer. And that's a really important point to take away. 
the civil service sees the minister as the customer. One of the things that did annoy me about that, there were several, was that it's like they're still waiting for the monarchy to come back because they treat you like little princelings. Your office is an art gallery. You get a driver. You've got loads of staff. Nothing's too much trouble. You're the minister. And that gets right on my nerves because I'm from a working class family. We spent more on a conference table than my dad had ever earned. I don't think he'd mind me saying that. You know, and then we didn't look after it. And it's little things like that just really get on my nerves. Ministers should be really cutting down at what's spent on them. But the point is, it is a problem sometimes that the civil service looks to the minister as a customer. Two reasons. One, they don't always do what they're told. Sometimes we've had the government say it wants a policy on one particular issue, and the civil service will say to the public that's what they ought to be doing, and then do something else. And I particularly have in mind some aspects of what is known as woke culture, but I don't want to get, just distract myself. But the point is, the civil service will do its own thing because it's always waiting for another customer to come along. And, and the second thing is, what is the product? Because as a minister, I saw time and again that the civil service, God bless them, is perfectly capable of producing big PowerPoint decks as a product. But my voters in Wickham don't care about PowerPoint decks given to ministers. They care about their lives being better, which brings me on to your point and Paul Dolan's passionate and brilliant call. The first thing I did when I got involved with politics was go and work for the Centre for Social Justice. Why? Because I appreciated that doing the right thing means lifting the poor out of poverty, directing the state's scarce resources, because it is going to be there and it is going to spend our money, into doing the most good. What an extraordinary and terrible thing it has been through this crisis, as Paul has so eloquently set out, that the machinery of the state and middle class existentially terrified people have put such costs on everybody else. Uh, as the Conservative Party, I would implore all of you to know what we stand for. We should stand for freedom under the rule of law, above all else. But we've got to accept there's going to be a state and it should do the most good it can with scarce resources. And I I'm really, I'm personally going to go and make sure I've clipped Paul's appeal on this point, because to your point, we should be making sure that the scarce money we have does the most good it can, and that requires us to have this well-being analysis. And to your point, this is my final thing, we've got to find about 10 billion to fix UC, and I think we know how to fix UC, because you, amongst others, have set out how. Um, but it's not 6 billion, it'll be 10 billion by the time we've done the work allowance and the taper rate, and we should do it, but it's a sixth of the defence budget. It's a lot of money. In the book called The Blunders of Our Governments, there's a whole series of big projects, that, and it ends up saying that too often ministers have, I think they call it cultural dissonance. Basically, ministers too often don't really know how other people live their lives. Right, well, I don't know how to get other, I don't, there's lots of people's lives, I don't walk in your shoes, I look around this room, I know absolutely every one of you has got your own unique experience that I haven't lived. But I, and I don't, know, I don't know how to bring in all those people's experience, but I know there's lots of representation, representational organisations like your own who we should listen to, but a beginning to it all would be for us all, out of this depths of this, the misery that we've had of this crisis, for us all to start thinking again about who we want to become and what kind of country we're trying to create. Because if this is not a time for idealism, and an absolutely resolute determination to create a better world, then, then I don't know when we're ever going to do it. So um, I've said enough. And <laughs> Thank you. Laura. Well, I'm going to bring us down slightly from a better world. But um, I, I think just um, on, the, on the point about the civil service, Steve's absolutely right, as ever, that actually the, the primary thing here is ministerial drive and accountability. Because unless you have that, unless you're asking for the right information, then you're not going to get it. You can't just expect for it to materialise from thin air from the civil service. That said, I do think, I mean, despite the many brilliant civil servants that work there, there is a real case for civil service reform. I think being more focused on outcomes, making sure there is accountability for individuals who rest within the civil service, and making sure that we have diversity of opinion and thought, and that people from a, a range of backgrounds come through the system, is actually really important. So I think that it's, I mean, it's, I, group think is a problem, within the civil service, I think, and, and making sure that we attract talent from a wider range uh, of backgrounds and that we allow that talent then to flourish because that is a big problem, people coming in from outside and culturally not fitting within the civil service, um, I think are, are very important topics. Um, Daisy, to your point on um, how do we ensure that a variety of voices are heard, this I think is really interesting because 
to, to Paul's point, it has to be meaningful engagement because too often you see these listening <coughs> exercises and they don't actually result in anything. Um, and you are dealing with the most precious resource at all, which is time. So trying to make sure that you are, you know, I've sat there as a policy advisor. How do you make sure that you're talking to a range of people uh, that will inform the policy decisions with very, very limited time? Organisations like yourself really help because you do take a group of people synthesize it down and then purvey that to government. I think that's, that's really important. Um, but it's also being able to uh, get out there, talk to people, and having the freedom and the space to be able to do that. And that depends on uh, having the time to be able to do that and also having the desire. And I think that what we've seen in the past, uh, you know, it, 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 being able to get out and about again, I think will be, a, will be a really good thing for the government and for policy advisors within it. Let's see, let's take two more questions. Um, the lady at the back there, please. Yes. And then and after that, we'll take the gentleman at the front. Thank you. Esther Webster um, for me. Sorry. Um, all the contributions have absolutely been really thought-provoking, but nowhere has it been mentioned the influence of the press, the oh, well, inf yeah. influence of publicity, which we've seen very recently in things like the fuel shortage. How would the panel address the problems of being open and accountable and all the rest of it with sometimes uh, a hostile press. Thank you. And if we could get a microphone to the, to the gentleman at the front, in the front row here. Hello. Uh, first of all, a huge thanks to the panel. Very interesting discussion. And a huge thanks for being a voice during the pandemic, the darkest days that some of these ideas were being raised. It was extremely refreshing. And thank you. Um, my background is I'm firstly an LSE alumnus, so very proud, proud to be here. Uh, and I was a strategy consultant advising the top tiers of the government during the COVID crisis. And my, my question goes to Steve's recommendations, or, or one of them in particular, of how do you go about regulating models? It sounds like a fantastic crowd-pleasing idea as such, and I, I agree with the principle behind it to a certain extent, but the team running the model at the top of government were extremely qualified data scientists, AI specialists, the best the country had, and ultimately regulating what they were doing was not going to change the, the answer <coughs> that, 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 that they came up with. So I was just interested in some concrete proposals on that point. Uh, Steve, because I know right, the time well, is short. I'm just, gonna, I'm just checking. What, I'm going to give you this paper, which has the complete answer. Have all my notes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but uh, so you'll read in there for yourself. We need, I'm afraid, a new office of research integrity, which could be a very small office, but it needs to be a very expert office, and it needs to do the things in that paper, which I've published, which Harry here is going to make sure is on my Twitter feed if anybody else wants it. Um, but it's not... Please don't think I'm criticising people, certainly not for incompetence or anything, but there are just some institutional things which have gone wrong with these models, and we can't keep, we just can't keep having models demonstrably be profoundly wrong, and yet we've had the most immense impact on people's lives as a consequence, and then do nothing. So uh, there you are. Enjoy your reading, and if you want to drop me an email, given how influential you obviously are, Harry here will sort out, we can have a, com a conversation about that, okay? I think I made the slides that you guys were joking about. <laughs> Not influential. We'll sit down with a bottle of wine in that case. <laughs> absolute PowerPoint corrupts absolutely, as we know. So, um, uh, do you I'm slightly go I've got to go and make my next thing. Well, thank sorry, you very much to Steve for your, sorry, sorry. for your time. Um, I'm now going to move on to the rest of the panel, including asking two politicians if they want to criticise the press. No pressure. <laughs> I won't take it personally. Um, Laura. Um, well, I think the point about regulating models, I think, is really interesting. But this comes back to my earlier point about if you had a bit of challenge within government, I think that that would help. But there are so few people with this skill set that actually being able to interrogate that is really difficult uh, from a wide, for a wide and broad base. So I think that, you know, having a wide array of people who are capable of dealing with numbers and with large data sets, I think, is really important. Um, on the point about the press, I think this is a, it's, you know, it's such a difficult dynamic because you want to, I, I alluded to it earlier on in my uh, kind of opening remarks, in that when you think about projects, you want to be very open about where things are working, where things are not working, but admitting failure is a real problem. And I, I actually think the answer to that is just being brave <coughs> as, a, as a government and being really forthright, because I think over a while, it, become, it was surprising at first, but after a while, you just come to accept it and you just say, OK, we're really rigorously anal um, analysing this. Actually, we've got this right, we've got this wrong. Being very forthright, I've I found over time that the most effective thing is just to be very brutally and frankly honest, and that generally gets you most of the way. Great. 
Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, if we're looking at ways to combat groupthink um, and to to be less reverential, to, the system is less reverential about the experts, then frankly, I think a, a vigorous press is an asset uh, in this. It may be uncomfortable um, you know, for people like me and, uh, and Laura uh, from time to time, but actually, I think that, you know, that degree of people taking a, a skeptical view and looking for a different perspective, uh, I think is more healthy than uh, the not, and um, and so I, I don't think that's the problem. I think the problems is, are in some other parts of the system. Um, on the uh, on the models, so I don't think it's about the regulation of models. Although um, my select committee, the science select committee, has just opened an inquiry onto research reproducibility and integrity, so that if you do if you do publish uh, data, the the, the uh, and uh, and make recommendations, other people should be able to. Take the same same data set, or and and have access to what's the working inside the black box, uh, as it were. And I think that is important. I, I think we have, during the pandemic, placed too great an emphasis on the the point prediction of models, uh, of the numbers there. You know, the latest prediction. Now, they're they're hedged in uncertainty. It all depends on the assumptions. Uh, and the LSE, is, uh, as you know and, and Paul knows, have lots of different disciplines that rely on, uh, on modelling. But the purpose of a model is not to come up with a, a number and say, this is how it's going to be. It's to understand the forces that are going on. And I think during the pandemic, we've ended up taking too much... Uh, investing too much in the number that came out at the end of the, the machine rather than what the, the true purpose of modelling should be is to be an attempt, given the uncertainty that Paul quite rightly described, to try to understand what's going on. And that would be my criticism of the role of modelling in the pandemic. Paul? Yeah, no, I think that's a super, super answer. I think we don't, we psychologically don't like heterogeneity. We don't like distributions and variants and we don't like uncertainty. So the point estimates give us that psychological comfort. Um, and I think that's obviously part of the behavioural reason why we, why we get ourselves into those kinds of mistakes. I think the other thing is just to emphasise something Steve said at the beginning about incentives to act in particular ways. We know that people respond to incentives. I mean, that's a very basic fact. And, you know, going back to Ash's early experiments in the 1960s or whatever, when you show people lines on a board, when you, when you unequivocally know that one line's longer than the other, yet everyone else says the other one is, mm. overwhelmingly people will go with what other people say. Um, and, you know, once, once, once a load of experts come out and say one thing, you can either do one or two things. You can either go with them and all be equally right or wrong, and that's much more comforting. Or if you think you might have a better answer, it's really hard to stand out and be different because it could be that you're the only one that's wrong. So we need to try to embed those practices that ensure that we have more of an adversarial collaboration. That's what we're trying to do in academia, right? You bring together people who have very different priors, explicitly, to work on a research topic, rather than trying to pretend that we don't have these priors, that we're just scientists. But actually, we all have our own biases, prejudice, you know, that come to particular decisions. So I think we should be flushing those out much more. Um, and the celebration of mistakes, there's no, there's, it, one, of the, one of the biggest challenges in any organisation and institution, be that public or private, is celebrating when we get things wrong, right? But actually, you, you all all know from your personal lives as well as in work, where you've learnt the most lessons is when you've fucked up, not when you've got it right, right? So that, how, you, how we can have an institutional memory of the things that we tried that didn't work, I think that is fundamentally where a lot of our attention should be directed. And just very quickly on the press... I mean, f throughout the pandemic, we have literally had contextless numbers. We have literally had number of deaths, hospitalizations, uh, and infection rates. And it was such an opportunity to place some of those numbers in context. Even death rates, for example, could have been placed in the context of the number of people that die every day. That would be, by now, the public would be having a much, we would, we would all be having a much more grown up conversation about the ways in which people die, the risks that people face that they might be willing to take or the state might intervene to 
mitigate. It was such a missed opportunity to just keep seeing. And of course, those numbers don't get shown when they're in the tens, but they then shown when they're in the hundreds. And, you know, I think that's where the press should be held to account. And that's all the press to some large extent, I think. Thank, thanks for that. Uh, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, the lady here on the aisle and then the, the lady here, please. Um, hello, I'm Alison Rankin Frost, and I'm a LSE alumna, a governor of LSE, and co founder of the Hayek program at LSE, which um, we just started during the pandemic, so you will hear more about it. And we haven't forgotten Hayek, you'll be glad to hear. Uh, one of the reasons for starting the Hayek program was to promote di the diversity of thought agenda. And um, so it's coming on, <laughs> and what I tend to think that with diversity of thought, it's usually people that have got the same intellectual abilities and um, the same um, neurocongruent, if that's the opposite for neurodiversity abilities, that are getting involved in the decision making. And I think there's a, a huge opportunity to involve people with learning disabilities and um, neurodiversity. And just the you know, the people that aren't as smart, the people with low IQs in in getting involved in decision making. The other thing that I think that has Sorry, been, can I can I press you to a question, please? Yeah, the Sorry. other thing I think that hasn't been touched on much is that you can have um, as much involvement in, uh, you know, d diversity and information and process of decision making. But if people are afraid to raise the points and to to say something that isn't acceptable to their peer group because they're worried about losing their jobs, then I think that that um, psych psychological safety issue is probably the one that needs the most attention. Thank you. And the, the lady here in the second row. <coughs> Hello, Tara Austin. I work for the Ogilvy Behavioural Science Practice and um, also the Conservative Drug Policy Reform Group. Um, and my question is related to the one about the press and the last question. Um, weirdos and misfits, uh, we all know who we're talking about, and um, uh, Dominic Cummings was ridiculed in the media for using that kind of language and asking for those kinds of people. He was considered Machiavellian for setting up the data science unit within number 10. Um, he, he's, he's been Whitehall's greatest critic, arguably, but a very powerful person who was a provocateur and someone who seemingly didn't really care what people said about him. Do we need another Cummings at the heart of government? So two related questions in various ways about types of thinking, types of decision making, and, um, and, and also how a system can, can work with, with individuals. Um, Greg, can I come to you first? Uh, yeah, cl clearly it goes from everything we've been talking about today, that having different perspectives who feel empowered to express themselves is very important to guard against the groupthink that is in the uh, in the title that we've been given uh, to discuss and so one of the actions is to to deliberately find ways to to encourage and to protect the the positions of people that do come with a, a counter view and I think that's a very important uh, learning and I think that does extend to the um, to the weirdos and, and misfits uh, point um, and you know, Dominic Cummings uh, has uh, has many qualities, um, uh, positive and, and negative. But actually, in terms of, uh, I think a an, an appreciation of the uh, of the importance of thinking things, or allowing different thoughts to be considered. I think he was very valuable uh, in that, and uh, and it's coupled with a. With due respect to being sponsored by an academic uh, institution, which is there to be outside government and to and to offer advice, having people in government that are driven to to do things and to to achieve things, I think, is very important. And what I have in mind there is Dominic Cummings um, told my committee that. Um, one of the conditions for him agreeing to serve in government was that we doubled the science budget um, in this country. And so whatever you think of, um, uh, of Dominic Cummings' behavior and actions, and I've had my differences with him, as uh, many people in this room knows, I think that was a very valuable um, 
focused contribution that he made, and I hope that uh, it will be delivered and, uh, and retained. And Paul, if you'd like to Yeah, I think, uh, to speak to, to, to many of the points, I think one of the key lessons, it's the behavioural side. I mean, any, any, any form of change in behaviour requires, at the first step, acceptance. And I think that that's the bit that we often, it's a very obvious thing to say, but that we forget. First of all, accept that we don't actually really like people that disagree with us very much, mm -hmm. right? I mean, there's good reasons, many reasons, why that's, why that's the case. So accepting that about ourselves is a good start, right? First of all, accept I don't like, I like people that nod rather than shake their heads. <laughs> um, as individuals and as organisations and as institutions, I think if we can do that bit, that's a really, really good start. Um, the, um, the issue of, stat so of weirdos and misfits is, of course, most weirdos and misfits are actually weirdos and misfits in the, in the sense that, you know, it's one of the reasons teachers don't, teachers will say in you know, school that they want creative and innovative children, of course, mostly they don't. <laughs> By and large, because creative and innovative people have really, really do lots of silly things. So most of the time, creativity and innovation is actually harmful, but we just we, we tend to focus attention on the bit where it's helpful. And, and of course, sometimes it is helpful. But again, accepting that by and large, most of the time, crazy ideas are in fact crazy, right? <laughs> Whilst being able to sort of separate the wheat out from the chaff is, is really a kind of significant problem. But again, it's an acceptance point of view. Um, and I would, I, I would, so I'm going to write, my, my, my next book is going to be on the polarisation problem. Um, and you know, I'm going to spend a lot of time over the next couple of years actively listening to people that I disagree with, like really paying attention to them, because I think that's where most of the lessons will really genuinely be learned, um, even if I end up becoming even more entrenched in my views that I'm right to begin with. Um, <laughs> but, at least, but at least I've offered them the opportunity. Um, but the thing about standing out, I think, is really interesting. We, we, we have a narrative of ourselves as being much more willing and wanting to stand out than we actually do, right? So if you look at lawyers and bankers and politicians to some large extent, they all wear... They all wear the same suit, basically, right? It's all sort of brown or blue or white or grey or whatever. We're not and gonna, then they wear, not and then they wear, and then they wear, and then they wear, and then they wear crazy colour socks, right? <laughs> and the socks are the representation of their difference, right? And they pay attention to the socks be, making them so different, but the suits all the fucking same, right? So actually, most of the time, we don't want to stand out. We really want to want to fit in. And again, accepting that is is again another powerful way to overcome some of these issues and challenges. There are quite a few academics say to me privately at the LSE, um, I'm glad you're doing what you're doing and saying what you're saying. And I said, well, why don't you too if you share similar views? Um, because I don't want to stand out. Um, you know, fundamentally, that's, you know, that's what most people don't want to do. You want to fit in. Mm -hmm. so, so there is a real, real issue about how you try to, try to flush out some of what people really believe privately from what they're willing to say publicly, and I just draw attention to a really cool econ paper um, looking at um, male preferences about spouses going out to work in Saudi Arabia. And the public information that they share is that their wife shouldn't work. But, each, but many men privately think that I'd like my wife to, but I know that other people won't think that. So you get a different equilibrium in public and private. Um, and I think a lot of what we see in politics is obviously the public equilibrium, mm -hmm. but how we can get deeper. I think so many more people have shared the views <laughs> that I and we have held for the last 18 months, mm -hmm. but they haven't felt it able to say it. Mm. Laura. Do you know one of the things that I think we've lost slightly the ability to do, or the desire to do, is to argue our point now. So too many things, I think, are taken as an article of faith rather than something that you have to be able to defend. You have to be able to say, okay, right, I take your point, this is what I counter it with. This is, you know, and actually, changing your mind in that context, it's actually really important to be able to do that, and it's not a weakness. If you're, defend if you're defeated in an argument because somebody's made better points than you, that's fine, maybe they're right and maybe you're wrong. And I think that having that as a, as a kind of mindset, it, both in public policy making and generally in political life, is, is really important. I think we we'll, we'll get across a lot of the, the issues that we've, uh, we've raised today as being problematic. So see the uh, gentleman at the front here and the lady over there. Oh, oh, can you still have the microphone, please? Dominic Connor, uh, Conservative Science and Technology Forum. My background is mostly in financial markets, mm -hmm. technology and risk management around that. And we have this huge pile of people who are experts in modelling. <coughs> there is an industry of risk modelling and governance, which the government hasn't tapped into 
at all. We've had some calamities. I think people may have noticed that not everything in financial markets went exactly perfectly. So my first point is that could you please come and talk to financial markets about the lessons we have very painfully and expensively learned? Um, second thing, um, I'm a headhunter in financial markets, and I do have to say the idea that the government has the best data scientists working for it, I think the nicest word I can come up with is laughable. Basically, the problem with IT people in the government is they earn one, I came across this one guy who was earning less than my nanny. Right. And he was doing something quite important. The, the government does not have good data scientists. I don't think it, forget the best, they're not good. Thank you. <laughs> but, but I'm sad to say the microphone's going that way to the lady at the front. So. Hi, I'm Chloe Chaplin from the I newspaper. I just wanted to circle back to the discussion earlier about you know being prepared for a crisis like like the COVID pandemic. As we all know, the government has pushed back any inquiry and is saying that it's not the right time. What's your response to that? Uh, do you are you concerned that if the pandemic takes another negative turn, that people's lives could be adversely affected because a public inquiry hasn't been held now? And do you think any public inquiry will be largely point pointless unless it's discussing the topics discussed today in the panel? Uh, thank you both. Laura. Okay. Um, to, I think it's a really interesting point. Uh, sorry, I didn't catch your name, but in terms of financial services, because I think that actually, if you look at the regulation of financial services now and the preparedness of the financial services industry for the pandemic, it was much better than in a lot of other areas and I think that does show that lessons have been learned and I think we should look at the kind of regulation of the industry versus other sectors and I mean you may agree or disagree but look, kind of look at how that how that has worked and what what lessons we can learn for it and I think to your point about the challenge you know it is we need to have external challenge for some of these models that we've got coming through so the expertise exactly as you identify can be used and we can see whether you know things are right they're going in the right direction but that's the kind of external scrutiny that I think we really need um, in terms of the inquiry, I, I think it's really important that we have one. I inquiries do need to be done at, at the right time, but it means well, you know, when we're not in the middle of it, I think is, is very important. Um, I've been working, uh, as we've mentioned before, on the Health and Social Care Committee um, uh, under the leadership of uh, Greg and Jeremy uh, to look at some lessons learned, and that should hopefully be out sooner. Greg. Uh, thank you, Mark. To Dominic's point, so... Uh, my committee did take evidence from uh, from modelers in financial services and um, uh, professors of economics um, who who contributed an analysis that you should be cautious about the the, the outcome the outputs uh, of models and uh, and actually it allows me to make a kind of broader point that we know in economics and you know, the LSE obviously has a lot of economists. Everyone knows that economics is very disputatious. Um, you would never advance a, a public policy in saying, well, the economists have told us so. Because it's, it is impossible to, uh, virtually impossible, to kind of think of an issue in which there's a kind of uh, unanimous uh, view. And actually, I think we've, we're coming to see that there is a range of views amongst scientists, perfectly well-intentioned and uh, an expert generally. And I think it's a... I think it's a good thing that this has been revealed and that the, the notion that there is this, um, you know, kind of elevated um, group of people who simply need to hand down the answer and then politicians simply implement it is not the case. There's, it's part of a, uh, part of a dialogue and, uh, and I hope that our report will reflect that. To Chloe's point, I think um, I, I agree with the government's uh, position uh, on the public inquiry. I think it should come... Um, uh, once the pandemic uh, is over, it clearly isn't over yet. But that is one of the reasons uh, why the the inquiry that Laura mentioned, the um, the joint inquiry of the Health and Social Care Committee and the Science and Technology Committee, has been taking place, knowing that it would be some time before we get to the end of it and can look back. There are important lessons to be learned on the way, including in what's been, I think, a fascinating discussion, some of the things that came up here have very much found a resonance uh, in our inquiry. And we hope that what we produce in a short period of time will serve to be a very substantial set of reflections on what's happened, 
but also practical recommendations that we can get on with, and that was part of the point uh, of doing what we've done. Thank you. Paul? Um, no, nothing much uh, further to add, actually. I think those, they were, um, as always, excellent answers. Just on the public inquiry, again, just to, just to restate my earlier point was, you know, when you drop a pebble of policy or a massive stone, as we've done over the last 18 months, into the water, you don't just want to look at its initial splash. You want ripple effects downstream captured. And I'm very concerned that we will just look at the splash. And so before I take the next round of questions, there's a question of my own that I'm going to give you due warning of, so you have a little bit of time to think about it. Steve mentioned earlier the idea of a red team or the kind of Israeli concept of the 10th man um, to think something else. We on the panel and our audience in the room are, by definition, we're self-selected. We're here because we're interested in this topic. We're all civilised and lovely and insightful and have been nodding and smiling and agreeing on quite a lot of different things. Were you charged with each of you with being taking the red team response to the discussion you've, we've had on the panel, I'd be interested to know, as the final answer to give in a few minutes, what you would say we're missing, or what you think we're wrong, what trap we we might be falling into in this discussion. Um, just to fly that flag now, um, so it makes a slightly more fair question. Uh, let's, uh, yeah, sadly, Paul's got to go. Um, uh, let's take two more questions, and then oh, two hands. One here, and one at the back. Hi, uh, I'm Danny from Halton Conservative, I'm chairman. Uh, it's just a, I have to apologise first of all because I do have autism, so you'll have to bear with me. Um, obviously, how to make better decisions and whatnot, COVID, particularly my household, was very hard. Uh, July 19, 2019, I got confirmed with autism. Uh, that same month, my mother-in-law got confirmed to have Huntington's disease. Uh, and my father-in-law with uh, cancer. So obviously COVID hit us hard. My partner had a nervous breakdown. So obviously it's been hard all over. Um, just a case of, you know, obviously we've all suffered in one shape or form, mental health, whatever. What better decisions can we take, particularly those who have suffered? Um, I'm as working class as you come, and I'm, I'm a self Thatcherite, but that's just me. Um, sorry. In terms of policies, uh, you know, those of us who are at the bottom of the economic scale, who are Tories, um, you know, one had, I had to work right through it, obviously. Um, obviously, you know, we don't claim benefits. I point to principle. I refuse to claim it. Um, you know, economic decisions, having mental health services in place. Um, on May 3rd, we had, which is my husband's anniversary, we had to have my mother-in-law sectioned. She's, she's still in uh, the institution. She's going to a care home next week. She's only 54, which is, in my view isn't odd. So, so those of us who are, well, scrap heaps, so to speak, what decisions can be done going forward to you know, help us help, basically? Thank you, Danny. And there was the second question there, who I think it was at the back. Hello, uh, my name is Rupert Lewis from the Royal Society and a former civil servant. Um, Greg, as a minister who asked for material on preparedness, uh, you are quite unusual. And for most um, ministers, if you think about preparedness and resilience and even paying for it, there's a conflict with what you want to do tomorrow. If you're the health secretary, how can you put a billion aside for preparedness at the cost of frontline services and doctors? Laura, as you said, in, in the financial sector, um, those decisions about resilience are not made by the Treasury. Uh, many of them are made by the Bank of England. I wonder if there's more, it's worth thinking more about how we detach the resilience decisions from the conflict that most ministers would have. Thank you both. So I think, um, I think Danny's question in particular is for the, for the politicians. And what, what policies can we actually change to particularly help to, to, to deal with many of those ripple effects that Paul, that Paul was talking about? Um, Laura. 
Um, firstly, Danny, I'm, I'm so sorry. I think that the uh, you know, everything that politicians should be doing it should be around improving exactly what you just talked about. Uh, and <coughs> I, I think that uh, the entirety of the state should be set up to help and support. And I think the things have got a bit better in that sense, but there's still much more to be done. Uh, and I think a lot of the things that we talked about earlier today would, would hopefully help with that. Um, Rupert, I think it's really interesting as in terms of detaching the decision making. But the only thing, I, and I, I, I think there is a role for much greater regulation in certain industries, and I think we've seen a, a failure of regulators in, in some uh, cases that we need to address. Um, but the only thing I would slightly disagree with you with is that this is obviously going to be the ministerial responsibility if you're landed with dealing with a crisis. You know, as Greg alluded to, you know, when something, when a storm really, really hits, it is the Secretary of State who has to step up and kind of be responsible and be accountable, crucially, for dealing with it. So I do think that it being at the heart of what you are driving your department to do um, and what you are interested in is actually critical for, it, for the response being effective. So yes, improve the regulators, but this still has to be key to what you are driving as a minister and you've got to make time for it. Greg. Uh, thank you. Well, first to, uh, to Danny. I mean, you've, you and your family have clearly suffered more than most uh, during the pandemic, and it's great that you're here and you've come through it, notwithstanding the continuing difficulties. Uh, uh, listen, I think we've got to learn from what we, what we did and what we experienced. And one of the things I think we need to learn is that some of the measures that we introduced, understandably, because it was done in a hurry, and without much information were very broad brush and they might have kind of worked for people on average and for most people but not for everyone and I think in particular for example uh, of people uh, with learning difficulties not, uh, autism is different from uh, from that but people with learning difficulties sometimes they need an advocate to to help express what they want from healthcare, and because of the restrictions on hospital admission, that they didn't have the person that they normally trust to be able to help them make decisions and get through the system. And I think that was, that was a very bad thing to, to do, and we ought to, to learn from this. It was understandable. It, it wasn't someone didn't think that, you know, let's ignore this. It was, it was in a hurry. But I think one of the lessons we should learn is that there are going to be differential impacts. And even if we have a general rule that we're going to suppress you know, accompanied visits to hospitals, let's you know, make a note of the people that need to be an exception to that so that we don't cause the degree of heartache um, that we did to many people who were vulnerable. Uh, to Rupert's point, um, uh, as Laura says, ultimately, there is a self-interest in, um, in preparedness on the part of ministers, cause, uh, and certainly on, on my part, having uh, seen what happened before I came in, I was determined <laughs> that was not going to happen to to me. And so, uh, uh, so, so requiring briefings um, may have been the right thing, but it was also uh, uh, had a personal motivation as well. Um, what I would say, in addition to what Laura says, is that you, you come into ministerial office from from different routes as a uh, as a politician. We all do, but I think, and perhaps this is a kind of reflection on on kind of what it means to be a minister. But but sometimes you know, ministers perhaps kind of see themselves as being kind of presenters of other people's work. That you know whether in Parliament at the dispatch box uh, <coughs> or on the TV, you know to kind of get a brief and make a good fist of presenting it. My view, not least because of the, you know, the responsibility that you have and the fact that the buck stops with you, is that you have to do that, of course, but you have to roll up your sleeves, you have to get in the weeds of it, you have to understand the, the issues, uh, you have to ask the tough questions and really interrogate policy advice and don't rely on someone else having kind of sorted out any chinks that it has, the buck stops with you. And so you need to be the person that asks the awkward questions, which I guess circles back to the overall thing. If we want to have more challenge uh, in the system and, and to, uh, to try to avoid groupthink, then actually the individual minister or secretary of state has a very important role in being that kind of awkward person that's asking the difficult questions themselves. And on that note, we have about 90 seconds left, so I'm actually going to ask Paul to address those questions, but also I'm going to 
boil down my question about oh, well, where's our group think to, to the real expert on the panel. So, so just quickly then on the group group think, because it's, it's, it's actually really more group say and group do. And often group say and group do are really different. And um, especially when it comes to mental health, the group say is that we're going to give it parity to physical health, we're going to put more into mental health policy. The group do is to not do those things that you've said you would. So I think, you know, again, about time we started doing what we said we would. Um, on, the, on the bit that's missing, I'm not sure it's a direct question to, to being, if there have been different perspectives in the room, but I think the powerful role of narratives and stories, we all know how powerful stories are in our understanding of the world, in making sense of the world, in our, in our support or otherwise for policies. And I think that we need to have a very long look at the narrative to preserve life, which has been so incredibly prominent over the last 18 months, that has meant that any, any questioning of that narrative, like we care about life experiences as well as life expectancies, because life expectancies haven't even been thought about, has been almost you know, shouted down as being murderous. Um, and I think that that set, uh, sets a dangerous precedent. And also just the language that we use about so many things, like I've stopped using the term low skilled for people who do jobs that are very, very high skilled, but just not the skills that are valued in wider society. Care, care assistants are very skilled people, but they're just not judged to be so. So I think the narratives that we have around the stories we tell about the lives that people lead as well as they playing into policy making is the thing that we need to give much more attention to in, in the future. Well, thank you very much. If I push on any longer, my colleague who's been carefully running all of these events will, uh, will have to gesticulate even harder. But we've squeezed every single second we could possibly find in this event, ladies and gentlemen, to provide just to touch on what I think is a really fascinating topic. Conservative Home will soon will certainly be returning to it in future. It's been a pleasure. Thank you to the London School of Economics and Political Science to partner uh, with us on this. Thank you to each of our panellists. They've been fascinating. You've been brilliant. I've been Mark Wallace. And <laughs> come to, uh, it's all I ever promised, um, do come along to our next event in here or the marquee and we'll see you soon. Thank you. <laughs>